I'm going to take a look at section 7.2. So we're getting into looking at surveys again and survey qualities and the size of the survey is really what's going to be important in this section. So make sure you have the notes for 7.2 in front of you. Also make sure you have a browser window open because there's a website I'm going to ask you to take a look at while we go through these notes. Uh, so it says evaluating surveys, statisticians evaluate the method used for the survey, not the outcome of the single survey. So the way the survey was done, and we talked in the last section about different types of biases, sampling and measurement bias, that's important. Additionally, um, whether or not it's a random sample and how large the sample is, is gonna be really important here. So when we talk about accuracy and precision, an estimation method should be what we consider both accurate and precise. So what do we mean by that? Accurate means that the measure, the method that we use measures what it was intended to measure. In other words, it correctly estimates the population parameter. So a good example, I always go back to like voting if we're thinking about, you know, asking people who they're going to vote for in a population. If we, before the election, we ask surveys and we say, okay, who are you going to vote for? Are you going to vote for this candidate or that candidate? Um, at the end of the, the election, we know how the population actually voted because we have the election results after the election is over. So how accurate was that survey? How close were the predictions made by our samples and our surveys to what actually happened in the population? The people who actually voted, the proportion who actually voted for that candidate, how accurate was it? And so we want to be accurate. Additionally, we want to be precise. So precise, what we mean by that is if we were to do the survey over and over, if the method is repeated again and again, the estimates are very consistent. So if we take polls and we see that the polling data for an election, for example, are all really close, um, you know, within maybe a percentage or two, maybe half a percent, that's an example of surveys that are precise. We want them to be consistent from one survey to the next. If the surveys are saying wildly different things, that will lead us to question maybe how the surveys were conducted. I like this little picture here. Um, our goal, of course, is the first one, accurate and precise. So we have four little bullets here and they're all in the bullseye where we want them and they're all really close to each other. This is an example where they are not accurate because they're not at the, anywhere near the bullseye, but they're precise because they're all close to each other. They're consistent. In this picture, they're accurate. They're closer to the bullseye, but they're not precise because they're kind of all over the place. In this picture, they're not accurate or precise. They're not close to the bullseye and they're not near each other. So let's do an example here. According to this website, as of June of 2021, PS5 had a global total global sales of a little over 9 million units, whereas Xbox had total global sales of a little over 5 million units. Find the population proportion, P, remember, so remember from the last section, our notation P represents the population proportion, PS5, out of the combined total global sales of both consoles. So I've done the math here for you. Let me show you what we mean by that. So the population proportion that we're interested in is the number of PS5s that have been sold out of the total number of sales for both consoles. So that's going to be that 9,748,000 number divided by the total. So if I add these two numbers together, the total I'll just tell you is about 15 million. Looking at my notes here, I think this is right. And if we change that, so this is a proportion, remember a proportion is a fraction. We can change that to a decimal by dividing it and we get around 0.63. And as a percentage, of course, that would be 63%. So in other words, out of the total, Total number of units that have been sold for these, these video game consoles, 63% of them were PS5s. So it says use the sampling distribution web at this website. So if you want to go to this website, you can. Um, and what I want to do is we're going to use this 63%. I want to show you some, some different sampling distributions. So if we were to sample, if we were to pull samples of different sizes, sample, 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 sample of all of these video game consoles, we want to look at how close our samples are going to get to the 63% number. So the first part of this says use the population proportion from part A and a sample size of 10 to find the mean of the sampling distribution. So let's talk about that for just a second, what we mean, the mean of the sampling distribution. So if we were to do sample, 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 sample of size 10, and we were to repeat this 10 times, so we have 10 samples of size 10 each, okay? And then if we were to calculate the mean for each of those samples and then take the mean 
let me say that again. If we were to calculate the proportion for each of those samples and then take the mean of all of those proportions. So sometimes we'll call this um, the mean, well, let me make sure I'm saying this right. The mean of all of those proportions for each of those 10 simulations, that's the, what we, that's what we mean by the mean of our sampling distribution. So the, we might say it this way, the mean of all of our sample proportions. That's a notation you might see once in a while. Is the p hat from each simulation necessarily the same as p? So what I want you to remember before I go to the simulation is what was p? This is really important. p was 63%. Each time we pull one of these sim simulations, p hat, remember, is the sampling proportion, the proportion from our sample. Is that going to be 63% each time? Every single time, is it going to be 63%? Let's figure that out. So let me go ahead and go to this website. I've already got it pulled up here. So our population distribution right here, p, remember, is 0 0.63. I'm going to come over to this side, and you can do this as well on your screen. I'm going to drop this down to a sample size of 10. And I'm going to start by just making, um, I'm just going to pull up one sample at a time. So sample size 10, one sample at a time. I'm going to draw a sample. And what I want you to focus on is for this particular sample, sample size 10, P hat is 0.6. So right away, my first question to you was, is, this, is P hat going to be the same as P? Well, you can see right off the bat, our first p hat is only 60%. Remember, p was 63%. So you can see right away, it's not the same. I'm going to go ahead and draw another sample. And so now what's changed? In my, now, if you're doing this on your own, of course, yours are different because we're doing random samples here. So yours numbers are going to be different from mine. But my p hat for the next sample is 50%. Look at that. So it's already different. I'm going to do it again because remember we want to do it 10 times total. I want you to observe how this p hat is changing. Look at this next one. It's only 10%. So it's really fluctuating quite a bit. There it is again. 10% again. 60% again. And then 60% again. I've lost track of how many I've done. Let me see. Okay, right here you can see I've done... Um, actually, no, it won't show me that. Hold on one second. I think... Here, oh, right here. This is what I was looking for. Eight simulations is what I'm up to. Let me keep going. There's nine simulations. There's 10 simulations. So you can see that P hat fluctuated every single time, and that's the takeaway there. So if you want to write that down, let me go back to the notes here. We're going to say, um, no, P hat fluctuates with each sample. Okay. So p hat fluctuates with each sample. All right, let's see what else they want us to do with these samples. It says repeat part b and find the mean of the sampling distribution. So this time I'm looking for the mean of our sampling distribution. So let's clarify what's happening, but we're going to do it using 100 simulations. So let's clarify what's happening. I don't want each individual p hat. What I want the computer to do is take all of those individual p hat values and I want it to calculate the mean of all of those p hat values. And that is what it's doing for me down here. So those 10 simulations I did just a minute ago, the mean p hat, I'm sorry, the mean for p hat is 0.49. So this x bar for all of my individual p hat values was 0.49. So I'm going to reset this. I'm going to leave the sample size at 10, but this time they told me to do 100 simulations. So I'm going to just click here, it'll do 100 at once. I don't have to do them one at a time, which is kind of nice. I'm going to click on Draw Sample. And what I want you to observe is a couple of things. This part right here is not quite as important now. This is just giving me the value from the last sample that it drew. I'm not as concerned with each individual sample now. What I want you to focus on is this part of the information. The mean for my sampling distribution, notice, is 0.621. So... What, let's go ahead and jot that down here. So the mean for me was 0.621. Now, if you're doing this on your own, of course, your numbers are going to be different from mine. But the mean for my sampling distribution was about 0.621. All right. And I also want you to observe, this is graphing. Basically, it's giving me like a accumulation of what all of those individual uh, proportions for each sample are going to be. 
Um, and I want you to observe what happens to this picture as we increase the number of samples. Let's do that. So in the next question, they want me to do this again, but they want me to use a thousand simulations. So let's go back here. I'm going to reset this and I'm going to click on a thousand this time and I'm going to go to draw a sample. Notice now that my mean is 0.637 and I've got a few more bars here. So let's go ahead and add that to our notes. So this time my mean is about point, oh, I forgot what it was. It was point, uh, where was it? 637. Let's go back and write that in. Oops, sorry about that. I'm hitting a button here. 0 0.637. Um, I also want you to observe that this number is getting a little bit closer to this number, and that's important. We're going to talk, come back to that idea in just a minute. Let's do this one more time with 10,000 simulations. So let's go back here. I'm going to reset this. I'm going to click on 10,000. I'm going to click on Draw Sample. All right, so now look at that. The mean is exactly 0.63. So let's come back over here. So our X bar for our sample, oops, sorry, I'm right in the wrong spot. X bar for our sampling distribution is exactly 0.63. And then it says to repeat this with a sample size of 50. This time, what I want you to pay attention to, not so much the mean of X, the, the mean of our sam each sampling distribution, but what you notice about the shape. This is the really important part now we're going to get into is what happens to the shape of the sampling distribution. So let's go back here. And I'm going to come back up to the top and I'm going to change this to sample size 50. I'm going to hit reset here. And I'm going to start, let's just do, let's do them one at a time for a second. And draw a sample. So there's one sample, two simulations, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10. I want you to notice right away what happens to this mean. The mean for my 10 simulations here, um, now I'm at size 50, don't forget. The mean for my 10 simulations here is 0.61. That's pretty close actually to our, uh, our original population mean, which was 0.63. So let's, let's come over here and let's write a few things down. Um, let's make some space. Let me get rid of this and let's come over here and write. So uh, with 10 simulations, the mean for X bar was 0.61. Um, let's do it again with 100 simulations, and then let's do it with 1,000 simulations. Let's make a little chart here, and then let's do it with 10,000 simulations. Okay. All right, so let's go back. Let's repeat it. That's an S, by the way. Let's go back and repeat it. I'm going to reset this time, and I'm going to remember my sample size is still 50, so I'm going to leave that the way I have it. And I'm going to click on 100, and I'm just going to have it do all 100 at one time. And here's what we have. So notice that my mean is 0.626, so let's jot that down. So my mean is 0.626. And then what I also want you to notice is what's happening to the shape of this distribution. Let's do it again. Let's go ahead and do a thousand. I'm going to reset it. And here it is for a thousand. So now my mean is 0.629. You notice that we're getting closer to that magic number of 63%. So my mean here is 0.629. And I also want you to notice, and this is really the more important thing, is what does the shape of this distribution look like? This should look very familiar to you to so something we talked about in the last chapter, at the end of chapter six, and that was a normal distribution. So the more, the more simulations we add, and really what it is, is the sample size. The more we add with a sample size of 50 this time, we're gonna get closer to this normal distribution. Let's repeat this one more time with 10,000 simulations. There it is again. So for 10,000 simulations of sample size 50, we get a mean of 63% exactly. That's our population mean. So we're getting really close to that population mean. Really, we're, we're there for all practical purposes. And I want you to notice that we almost have exactly a normal distribution. So that's really important. So let's jot a few things down here. So in this case, it was 0.63. 
and um, we got closer. What do you notice about the shape of p hat, the distribution for p hat? We got closer to a normal distribution. I'm going to do this one more time. I'm not going to go through all of these again, but I'm going to look at it with a sample size of 100. So I'm going to reset everything. Let's come back up here. I'm going to bump this to a sample size of 100. And I'm just going to draw, I'm going to draw 100 samples. Let's see what this looks like. So for 100 samples, you notice that the mean is a 0.632. So the larger that sample size got, the closer my mean got to 0.632. And, and the more samples we add to this, the closer this is going to get to that normal distribution. I could just keep on adding some, and let's see what happens. See, it gets a little bit closer. I can just draw another 1,000 samples. We can draw another 1,000 samples, 1,000 samples. And I want you to notice, the mean is 0.63. The mean for the sampling distribution is 0.63. And we're getting closer and closer to that normal distribution. So let's write a couple of things down. So how is the shape of the distribution of p hat different this time? We are getting closer to a normal distribution. So the moral of the story is, and the takeaway here, is that as n, and by n, I didn't really say what that was, n is our sample size. So as n gets larger, the shape of p hat or the sampling distribution so that's a really important term to remember the shape of our sampling distribution gets closer to a normal distribution and that's really 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 important that's going to be the focus for everything we do the rest of this semester so this is a really important fact couple of notes here. The estimator p hat is not always the same as the p parameter p, like we saw in that very first example. We said there was some fluctuation. You remember every time we pulled a sample, that p hat that we got changed just a little bit. It wasn't exactly 63%. It fluctuates from one sample to the next. So that's what we're saying here. The estimator p hat is, always, is not always going to be the same as the parameter p. p hat will fluctuate from one sample to the next. The mean of the sampling distribution p hat is always close to 63%. We notice that. It fluctuated, but the mean of that sampling distribution, so up here is where a good example of that. Um, when we did 10 simulations with sample size 50, we had 61% and then 62.6% or 62 .6 and then 62.9%. The more simulations we added, the closer it got to that 63%. But the point is, the mean of the sampling distribution, that p hat, is always close to that 63%. So what that tells us is that the estimator that we're using for p hat is unbiased. Why is that happening? Why is this unbiased? The reason that's happening is because we were using random samples. We had the computer doing it, right? So when the computer's doing those simulations, it's pulling random samples. So when we have random samples, we're always going to get an unbiased estimator of p hat. And what that tells us is that what we're getting for p hat, those means for p hat, they're going to be close to the actual population proportion, which is really good and really helpful when we're doing research. Finally, the standard error. So this is a new term for us, and this is a really important term. The standard error is the name we use when we talk about the standard deviation for that sampling distribution. So when we look at this, this is our sampling distribution. We pulled a bunch of samples. In this case, I, I hit the 1,000 button to repeat so many times. I got up to 5,100 simulations. So I did sample, 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 sample 5,100 times, and my sample sizes were 100. And so the mean for the sampling distribution we know is the same as that population means 63%. But that standard deviation, which we haven't talked about yet, that standard deviation, this number right here, we actually give that a special name. We call that the standard error. So when we're talking about a sampling di distribution, the standard deviation for it is called the standard error. And what does that measure? It measures how much we're going to vary from one sample to the next. So the variation from one sample to the next is going to be measured by that standard error. In my simulation here, this is a percentage, remember. If you move the decimal two spaces to the right, of course, that's 4.9%. That means from one sample to the next, the mean p hat that we got varied by about 0.9%. 
4.9%. It went up, it went down, but on average, it varied by about 4.9%. Remember, standard deviation is a distance. It's a typical distance each measurement is from the mean when we talked about it earlier in the course. That concept is the same idea. It's the typical variation from, of p hat from one sample to the next. So um, let's, let me add to that, because that's a really important point. So we could say it's the typical variation in p hat from sample to sample. So from one sample to the next, how much is p hat going to vary? That's what that tells us. That's our standard error. When the standard error is small, we say that the estimator is precise. And that should make sense to you based on what we talked about earlier. Remember those, those pictures. Precise means that they're all really close together. And there's a lot of consistency. We don't have a lot of fluctuations. So that means that when the standard error is small, we say that our estimator is precise or that it's consistent among p hat. Finally, our bias is measured by the distance between the mean center of the estimator p hat and the actual parameter p. So when p hat and p are the same, that's we say it's unbiased. So in that case, let me go back up here and add a point. So when p is equal to p hat, that's when we say that the bias is zero. Okay, and when we have a random sample, for our purposes in this course, we're going to assume that those that it's unbiased, and we can assume that bias is zero, as long as it's a random sample. Continuing from the last example, below are three graphs of sampling distributions of p hat in various sizes. So we've got graph A, graph B, and graph C, and what I want you to think about is which one of these would have the largest sample size. So based on what we saw earlier, in those simulations that we were doing. The, the larger the sample size, right, the larger the sample size, the less variation we had. Let me go back and just remind you, if we had a sample size, say, of size 10, let me just do a quick example. Sample size 10, this is, look at the spread on this graph. So this is a sample size 10. We did a thousand simulations. We could do we could do 10,000 simulations. It wouldn't matter. The sample size is 10. Look how much spread we have in this graph. Now, I'm going to reset this, and I'm going to go back and do a sample size of, say, 50 again. And I'm going to do the same thing. Look at the difference. We have a lot less spread in my sample size of 50, even if we do 10,000. It doesn't matter how many simulations we do. The sample size is what's going to determine that spread. So which of these is going to have the largest sample size? Well, it has to be the one with the smallest spread, okay? No, I said that backwards. The largest sample size, no, I said that right. The largest sample size is going to have the smallest spread. So the least spread or variation in your graph is going to be the one that has the largest sample size. And so hopefully you see that that is graph C, right? This one's got the least spread. Which one's got the smallest sample size? That's going to be the opposite scenario. That's going to be the one that has the most spread or the most variation. So that would be graph A. And literally, I mean spread, just like it was back in chapter three. We talked about how spread out visually is the graph. We have more values in between, more percentages in between here than we do in between here. Which one has the largest standard error? Okay, so standard error directly relates to, remember what standard error is. Standard error is basically your standard deviation. So standard error is talking about your standard deviation. And so the one that has the largest standard error is going to be the one with the most spread. All right, so the one that has the most spread means you've got the largest standard error. And again, that's going to be graph A. Okay, which one's going to have the smallest standard error? That's going to be the one with the least spread. Now, you want to think about standard error as like how close everything is to the, the expected 63% that we are expecting. So the one that's the closest to that, where the values don't fluctuate much from that, that's going to be the one with the smallest standard error. And, of course, that's going to be graph C again. And graph B would be somewhere in between the other two. All right, does do any of the graphs show any bias. So bias, what would, how would we get bias? We would have bias if um, our mean for our sampling distribution, if 
let's let's see how can we say that if this does not equal the true population proportion that's the question we're asking so if you go back up to your pictures here this little oval this sort of little orange oval let me zoom in a little bit this represents the the mean for the sampling distribution so what i want you to notice is these are all right around 63%. Remember that? And remember, these are from the same distributions we had earlier. The population proportion, remember, was 63%. These are all right around 63%. So because that's the case, then we're going to say no. None of these show bias. In all three of those graphs, the mean for your sampling distribution is around 63%, which, remember, was equal to our population proportion. So all of the means, all of the sampling distributions have um, means that are around the 63% marker that we wanted. And again, why is that happening? Because these were all done randomly. So these were all taken as random samples. So like I said, anytime you have a random sample, then you should not have any bias. So you can see we don't in these graphs. All right, so summarize a little bit of what we talked about. So the estimator, it says summary of the three distributions. This is really more just kind of general information. I'm gonna take off the word three distributions or three simulations. Um, the estimator p hat is unbiased. In other words, um, the mean for your sampling distribution is gonna to equal to the population proportion as long as we take random samples. Also notice that the precision improves. What caused the precision to improve? In other words, the standard error gets smaller and we have less spread as the sample size does what? As sample size increases. The size really does make a difference here. So as the sample size gets larger, the precision gets better because the standard error gets smaller. That's really, really important. Um, finally, the shape of the sampling distribution is sym symmetric. Well, let's say, yeah, symmetric. Well, let me do it this way. Let me write, let me say more symmetric. Get rid of that real quick. So the shape of the sampling distribution is more symmetric as sample size increases. All right, so again, as the sample size increases, precision improves, the standard error gets smaller, and the shape gets more symmetric as the sample size increases. It approaches, there's actually no number four here, it approaches the normal distribution. The larger the sample size, the closer you get to a normal distribution. And that's going to be the foundation for everything we do the rest of the semester. So these two points are really, really important takeaways. Um, the bias of p hat is going to be zero for our purposes as long as we're using and we're told that we're using a random sample. Okay, now how do we calculate the standard error? This is a really important formula. We're going to use this quite a bit for the rest of the semester. The standard error, the notation is this capital SE, and it's the square root of P times one minus P divided by N. So remember this formula. This is one we're gonna use quite a bit. You're gonna remember it. We're gonna calculate this a lot, so you're gonna memorize it pretty quickly. But to compute the standard error, it's gonna be the square root of P, the population proportion, times one minus P divided by N as long as the following conditions are met. The sample is randomly selected from the population of interest, and if the sampling is done without replacement, the population must be, this is another key point, the population must be at least 10 times larger than the sample size. Let's do an example and let's kind of summarize all this. So according to a newspaper, 77% of high school seniors have their driver's license. Suppose we were to take a random sample of 100 high school seniors and we find the population, or we find the proportion of our samples who have a driver's license. So a couple things I wanna make a note. P is equal to what here? P is the population proportion. So what proportion of all high school seniors have driver's license? That would be 77%. Our sample size is N, and so our sample size in this case is 100. So we're gonna pull random samples, 100 students at a time. What value should we expect for our sample proportion? So each sample, we would expect it to be the same as the population mean. Why? Because 
they are doing, we are doing random samples. So since we're doing random samples, we expect each p hat to be the same as the population proportion, which is the 77%. Now, is every single sample we pull going to have 77% with a driver's license? No, some might be 76%, some might be 78%, but we expect it to be around 77%. All right, let's compute the standard error. So now I'm using that new formula that we have above. So P times one minus P divided by N. You must change your percentage to a decimal. So it's gonna be 0.77 times one minus 0.77 divided by 100. And you're gonna put this in your calculator. I'm gonna skip the details here and tell you that I got about 0.042. Um, if you wanna make that a percentage, that would be 4.2%. So what does this mean? We expect the samples to the proportion of people who have a driver's license, the seniors who have a driver's license, we expect it to fluctuate by around 4.2% from one sample to the next. So how do we interpret these values? Well, that's basically what I just said. So if we were to randomly select 100 seniors, at a time, we expect about what percentage to have their driver's license? We expect about 77% to have a license. Uh, I cannot spell that word, license. license. Um, give or take, how much? So how much is this gonna fluctuate? Give or take about, that's your standard error give or take about 4.2%. So we expect the samples to fluctuate by about 4.2% on average from one sample to the next. All right, last question, and this is probably the most important part. If we increase the sample size from 100 to 500, so if we increase N now to 500, what effect would this have on the standard error? So we mentioned this earlier. What did we say earlier? We said, let me go back, let me go back to our notes earlier. We said, that precision improves, in other words, the standard error gets smaller as the sample size increases. So as the sample size goes up, the standard error gets smaller. That is so, so important. How do we get better precision? How do we get better surveys, better sampling? We in increase the sample size, that will always do it. Mathematically, that should make sense. If you see the formula, this should make sense, that if the denominator of this fraction gets larger, what does that do to the fraction? That means the fraction gets smaller. So, right, as a denominator gets larger, the fraction gets smaller. Mathematically, that should be really, really intuitive to you, that as the fraction or as the denominator gets larger, the entire fraction gets smaller. So that mathematically, that's gonna reduce your standard error. And if you just wanna kind of think about that, you can say, um, we can say that, uh, let's see, so a, let's, how do we say this? We say the larger sample size means we're gonna have a smaller standard error. And mathematically, like I said, that's because that denominator is getting larger, which means the fraction is getting smaller. So this is this is really important. We're going to use this again. Remember that point. We're going to see that again as we go through the rest of this chapter.